Hi, I'm Leslie Diana Jones. I'm the Associate Director here at the Law Library, and we are pleased to have you and welcome you to our HLS Library Book Talk. The book talk today is, bar, is about bars, Why the Innocent Can't Get Out of Prison by Daniel Medwick. And you can get a print copy of this book from the Harvard School, or you can get it from any of your local bookstores. So we'd like to say a special thank you to the Dean's Office for sponsoring the Faculty Book Talk series. And a special thank you to Maya Bergamasco. Maya is our scholarly, Faculty Research and Scholarly Support Librarian, and she's the primary coordinator of all of the book talks. We'd like to also thank our other librarians who are helping us out today. Christine Park, Juan Andres Fuentes, Debbie Deanna Mark Barmakian, and Debbie Ginsburg. And Lisa, right? <laughs> Can everybody hear me? I kind of talk a lot. <laughs> I figured you all could, but a mic is good. Okay. <laughs> So we're joined today by author Daniel Medwed, who will be in conversation with Professor Alexandra Natapoff. Daniel Medwed is a visiting professor at Harvard Law School and University Distinguished Professor of Law and Criminal Justice at Northeastern University School of Law. He is a founding member of the Board of Directors of the Innocence Network, which is a consortium of innocence projects throughout the world. And he is currently, he currently serves on the board of the New England Innocence Project. Alexandra Natapoff is the Lee S. Kreindler Professor of Law at, here at Harvard Law School. And she writes about criminal courts, public defense, plea bargaining, wrongful convictions, and race and inequality in the criminal system. She has testified before Congress and numerous state legislative bodies. She has helped draft state and federal legislation, and her work appears frequently in judicial opinions as well as the national media. Before we get started, please, if you have your phone, would you put it on silent? Or if you have any other device that makes noise, be sure to have it on silent. Thank you. So at this point, we will turn it over to Professors Medwet and Natapoff. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, I'll get started. First of all, thank you, uh, Leslie, Diana, for that lovely introduction. A special thank you to Maya for setting this up so beautifully. I really appreciate it. Um, and I just want to thank Sasha. Can I embarrass you? No. I'm going to embarrass her. That was a no. Okay, but is the truth embarrassing? No. So <laughs> let me tell the truth, okay? So Sasha, this book wouldn't exist but for Sasha's involvement. She helped me shape the proposal. She introduced me to her agent. That agent sent it to her publisher, Sasha, several years ago, wrote an award-winning book, a fantastic book called Punishment Without Crime, that is all about our enormous, what was the image, like a mountain of misdemeanors? Large pile. A large pile of misdemeanors about misdemeanor nation. Um, and it ended up at the same editor. That, so we share an editor, an agent, and a publisher, and a longstanding friendship that goes back 20 years, something like that. At least, at least. So basically, this is a long way of saying, you know how in law review um, articles, there's always a footnote that says, any mistakes are the authors and the authors alone. So any mistakes in my book are Sasha's <laughs> and, and, and Sasha's uh, alone. Thank you for joining me in conversation. My pleasure. Um, so I get to retaliate now because you started it. That's how this works. So when I first started uh, writing about innocence issues and wrongful convictions in the criminal system, Daniel was already a leader in the wrongful conviction world, a, le a leader of the innocence movement. And he taught me so much and included me in so many um, learning experiences and professional experiences. So uh, in many ways, he helped me get started in this space of innocence work. Thank you. So back at you. Back at you. That's a lie, but I appreciate it. Uh, so maybe I'll just start a little bit. Um, a couple of people have asked me sort of what animated this book, what prompted me to write a book. It's about why it's so difficult for the innocent to get out of prison. And as a lot of you know, there's a lot of literature and a lot of exposure about what leads to wrongful convictions in the first place. Mistaken eyewitness identification, prosecutorial and police misconduct, ineffective assistance of counsel, 
dubious or flawed forensic evidence, a variety of different things, false confessions. But there's been less literature about why it's so hard on the back end after someone who's innocent has fallen through the cracks and been wrongfully convicted, why it's so hard to free uh, that person. And this experience is sort of animated or my interest came about. Um, I'm a former public defender in New York. I was an appellate and post-conviction litigator at the Legal Aid Society. And then I spent four years running a small innocence project at Brooklyn Law School where my students and I investigated and litigate these, these cases. And I just kept you know, banging my head against a wall. It was so hard to overturn these cases, even with talk about a mountain of misdemeanors, a mountain of newly discovered evidence suggesting that these folks were, were innocent. In addition to that, I had a really, really, I still do, intransigent mother-in-law. Does anyone have that experience? Um, my wife was born in a small town in southwestern Nebraska in a county the size of Rhode Island, but with the population of Gropius, okay? Like very, very sparsely populated. To give you a sense, not, not to you know, sort of typecast her, but I will. Um, in the house where my wife grew up, her house, my, my mother-in-law's house, small little house on a farm, there is a wood plaque with a wooden pistol that's carved out of the plaque and the words, we don't call 911. This is what I'm dealing with, okay? So I'm a public defender and what she was telling me all the time over Christmas dinner was, you spend your life getting guilty people out on technicalities. Then when I started running an innocence project, she said, why would you need to do that? There are endless appeals. If an innocent person's convicted, there are endless appeals. Now, how many of you believe this, right? That the guilty get out on technicalities and that there are endless appeals for the innocent? I mean, you guys are in law school. You, you know that's not the case. But for a lot of people in this country, on the left or the right, on the right, there's a sense that public defenders and innocence projects are out there to get the guilty free, to spring them from the prison cell. And on the left, there is this faith, I think an unjustified faith in the system, maybe not in prosecutors or defense lawyers, but a faith in judges, that ultimately if judges are acting in good faith and they're presented with a significant amount of evidence that suggests a mistake is made or has been made, that they'll do the right thing. So I want to write a book that sort of exposed this for a popular audience. I mean, maybe writing about habeas corpus wasn't the greatest idea. When I look at my, Novus the Quorum Novus piece, when I look at my sales figures, I realize it was kind of a mistake, but. So that, yeah, that's what prompted it. So I have so many questions. Um, and eventually I want to get to this, to, to the end of this arc of what this tells us about our criminal system yeah. more broadly that, that all these ancient, writs in Latin that are so difficult to um, uh, to wield actually shape so profoundly our ability to revisit our own mistakes. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to riff about that in a minute, but can we can we set it up with just some specifics? So yeah. what are the writs? Yeah. <laughs> what are the things? What do they do just for the lawyerly minds? And yes. Can we just lay that out? Absolutely. I, you know, I want to do an article with you, a riff on writs. <laughs> Could we do it? <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to turn out I have to okay. learn how to spell the writs that's what I if I learn how to spell riff will you <laughs> learn to spell writ <laughs> okay so that basically if someone's convicted either at trial or through a plea bargain there are a series of sort of hidebound and traditional remedies that are available there are certain motions for a new trial that are usually very time restricted and aren't good vehicles for proving innocence in new york for instance there's a procedure that says you can bring newly discovered evidence back to the trial judge if you have uh, with if you found it within 30 days of the trial verdict not, not great, right? Like you've just lost your case. You're not going to find new evidence. So here are basically three buckets of remedies that exist in virtually every state. The first is the direct appeal. What's shocking to me, and I didn't even realize this in law school, there's no reference to the right to appeal in the U.S. Constitution. There's a reference to the jury trial twice, but there's nothing about the right to appeal. Now, fortunately, every state has given you a right to appeal your case at least once directly. It's considered to be a vertical remedy to one court. And if a state took away that right, it would probably violate due process. But we don't know for good reason. Maybe we don't know. We don't know. 
Um, so it's a creature of statute, and every state has given you this right to a direct appeal. But that sort of secondary status of the direct appeal in the litigation hierarchy is reflected in a lot of the litigation norms and the Supreme Court jurisprudence about this. For instance, there was this case called Davia back in 2017, which talked about how the trial has the pride of place in our criminal legal system. It's mentioned twice in the Constitution. The appeal is not mentioned at all. And so the trial is the main event, if there are any boxing fans in the room, and the appeal really is the undercard. It's not a way to overturn what some people would call a tier one error, an error based on inaccuracy, an error based on factual innocence. And there are a number of reasons for this. So as a vertical remedy, the direct appeal is limited to exactly what happened down below. You can't bring any new evidence, nothing new. So everything that happened at trial or in the plea colloquy or in pretrial missions, that's all that's cognizable. That's all that's recognizable. Even if you can find something, and I was an appellate lawyer, I'd scour these 500,000 page transcripts looking for legal issues. You can only typically raise issues not only that are there, but that were adequately preserved for review, where the, the trial counsel down below made an objection or made an adequate offer of proof for evidence that she wanted in. Then if you find a preserved issue in the transcript, you then have to deal with really deferential uh, standards of appellate review. A lot of really important evidentiary decisions, for instance, are given abuse of discretion review. You can only overturn the issue if you show that the judge abused her discretion or failed to exercise her discretion in rendering a decision. And even then, if there's an issue that's preserved and you can overcome the deferential standard of review, there's a doctrine called harmless error. I hate the harmless error doctrine. You show that there's an error, but then you have to show that the error somehow was not harmless. It somehow affected the outcome. Incredibly difficult. Direct appeal doesn't work, right? It's not a vehicle for proving innocence at all. That leads us to the second category. Those ancient writs, should we use like a faux British accent? I'm not gonna even try. Should I? You, Do you, you is it being wrong. recorded? Okay, I won't, okay? Um, so there are two really chief uh, ancient writs, one of which you've heard of, the second of which you maybe don't wanna learn about, but you're gonna have to because you're here captive and the doors are locked, right? Um, habeas corpus, you guys have all heard about habeas corpus, right? It's a Latin term that means you have the body. And it derived it from 16th century, no, not 16th century, 12th century England. And the idea behind it is you have an opportunity either before trial or after trial while you are being detained to force the government to justify why they have the body, why do you have the body in custody. And it's a way to hold the government accountable. And what's beautiful about this writ, it's not a vertical remedy. It's a, sometimes called a collateral remedy or a post-conviction remedy where you attack the conviction from the side. And in theory, you can bring up new arguments. You learn that the jury engaged in some misconduct behind closed doors and you learn about it later. In theory, you could bring that forth in a habeas motion. Here's the problem though. Habeas is typically only suitable for constitutional or jurisdictional errors. And in 1993, the US Supreme Court said that a freestanding claim of actual innocence is not recognizable in a federal habeas corpus petition. In other words, it doesn't violate the constitution to imprison or to execute an innocent person. That's what Chief Justice Rehnquist said in 1993, and that's the law. The Supreme Court just granted cert in the Richard Glossip uh, case some of you may have heard about, where perhaps, I'm not especially optimistic, I don't know what you're thinking about this, perhaps the Supreme Court could change its tune on Herrera, uh, which is that 1993 case, but I'm not so sure. So habeas isn't a great vehicle. The second post-conviction remedy, the one I forewarned you about, the ancient writ of error quorum nobis. This is the one from the 16th century, and it means before us. And it's a chance to go back to the original trial job, judge if you found newly discovered evidence that cast doubt on the integrity of the trial conviction. Sounds great, right? If you wanna prove that someone's innocent, someone who didn't do the crime was convicted after trial, you go back to the original trial judge with this new evidence and you say to her, look, your honor, you presided over the trial. If you were privy to this information, do you think the result might have been different? Sounds great. Here's why it's not so great. How many people changed their original decisions? 
how many people transfer out of law school? How many people say they hate law school after the first year, but stick it out? All of you, <laughs> all those Yale law students, right? right? People are very reluctant to challenge their own decisions. In part, and it's often called confirmation bias or, or, or tunnel vision. When you have made a decision or you've played a role in a decision, you're vested in it, right? You've decided to come to law school. And maybe before you made that decision, you weighed the pros and cons. But once you dove into it, you dove in with both feet, right? And the longer you're here, the less likely you are to retreat from it. Think about if that decision was a really bad decision. Or like you played a role in the conviction of an innocent person who's rotting behind bars in parchment or Angola or Sing Sing, right? You're not necessarily going to look at that new evidence with the equanimity that it deserves. You're going to overvalue the evidence that supports your original decision. Law school's great. I can do everything with a law degree. I don't know what that everything is, but people tell me that I can do everything with a law degree. And you'll discount all of the evidence that suggests it was a bad decision. Right? So that is not the best way to uh, free the innocent either. So the last bucket are executive branch remedies. And when Chief Justice Rehnquist in that 1993 Supreme Court decision said, actual innocence isn't recognizable by itself in federal habeas corpus, he said there is, and he used this word, you're gonna laugh, do you wanna laugh? Do you wanna laugh preemptively? He said that clemency was a fail safe for the actually innocent. The clemency, <laughs> That executive clemency, you go to the governor and you ask for clemency and that that's a fail safe. And if the litigation process doesn't work, if you fail through the direct appeal and through these post-conviction writs, you can just go to the governor, the good old governor, and the governor's board will do the right thing and extend mercy on the innocent. Well, the problem with this, or a couple of problems with this, the executive branch is very reluctant to look anew at facts related to guilt or innocence because they view that as the prerogative of the, of the judiciary and they feel as though it's overstepping. So instead, the people who are most likely to get clemency are the folks who have who've demonstrated remorse, who've accepted responsibility, who've made strides towards self-improvement during their incarceration. In fact, the term clemency, I think I mentioned this in class, I see some uh, of my students here, the term clemency derives from the goddess Clementia, who is a Roman goddess whom Julius Caesar cited to spare his opponents on the battlefield. And it means mercy or forgiveness. My wife and I named our second child Clementine. Right? That's cute. Okay. It didn't have the desired effect. I thought that would land better. It's a serious topic. It's a serious topic. Okay. So, how can you get mercy or forgiveness if you haven't done anything wrong, Sasha? Right? Isn't that to, to be forgiven, don't you have to have done something wrong? And if you're innocent, how do you get forgiven for something you didn't do? So the actually innocent are far less likely to get clemency than the palpably guilty who have come to terms with what they've done, with, with what they've done, maybe engaged in restorative justice or made other steps towards self-improvement. So basically, the options aren't great. Before we move on, you, you talked about the appellate process. You talked about these collateral yeah. challenges and writs. Can you, and you also talked about how the, the spirit of them and the philosophy yeah. of them is really around, uh, centers around this idea of the trial yes. as being central to our adjudicative process. But of course, that's not how the American criminal system works. 95% of all the convictions yeah. in this country are actually the result of a plea, yeah. not of a trial. So in a way, it's like your sixth column as a barrier to consideration of the innocent, because of course, innocent people plead guilty yeah. under pressure of plea deals and long sentences and the death penalty all the time. Can you just add yeah. that to the list I'm and, so glad. and connect that to the other one? Uh, I'm so glad you brought that up. So of course, 95% of criminal cases are resolved through guilty pleas and not after trial. And there are mechanisms for challenging all of these. For instance, when I was a public defender in Manhattan, many of my cases were plea cases. And you would, on direct appeal, you would challenge the initial pretrial suppression hearing. So it's a drug possession case and you need drugs to prove that the person possessed drugs. And maybe after the, the drugs come into evidence, the person pleads guilty to the drug charge because they knew they're know they're gonna lose at trial. 
So my issue on appeal was to challenge that Fourth Amendment search and seizure drug issue, or maybe there was a statement, a Miranda violation, and you'd challenge that. So in the direct appeal, you can challenge those issues. But what you can't do very well on either the collateral remedies I mentioned, both habeas corpus and quorum nobis, and the executive branch remedies, is show why your person's innocent. Because what happens in a plea deal as a precondition to a guilty plea is that the defendant has to walk into court and give an allocution or a colloquy and say, I did this on this day. So you have a statement on the record and admission of guilt. And proving the negative that you were coerced, and we know about the trial tax, we know about the pressure on the innocent to plead guilty. You're facing 25 years in prison, you might take an eight-year deal even though you're innocent, simply because you're risk averse, right? But how do you prove that when there's something on the record? Um, so it's much harder, of course, if, if it's a guilty plea. When I was running this Innocence Project, and I, I'm curious what you think about various Innocence Projects, we always had criteria about cases that we'd consider for taking on. And one consideration for us, we wouldn't take on guilty plea cases because we just thought it was too hard. We also wouldn't take on cases where people had less than five years remaining on their sentence because it would take too much time to litigate the case. And we wanted to divert our resources to folks who were actually in, in cages, right? So I think, I'm glad you asked about that because the guilty plea piece of this is such a problem because if the theory behind all of these remedies is the idea that the trial works, that the trial is an adequate sorting mechanism between the guilty and the innocent, that there are all these protections to ensure fairness, procedural fairness, and that the presumption of innocence is replaced by a presumption of guilt post-conviction. What does that mean when 95% cases, 95 of cases aren't adjudicated? And there aren't those facts, and there's not that vetting, right, through the crucible of cross-examination. Yeah, just, just to pull that thread a couple more inches, uh, the fact that the innocence movement is itself such a vital part yeah. of our criminal system, I think bears, you know, just sort of hanging out with that realization for a second. The, the innocence movement is collateral to the collateral, right? It's not part of the criminal system. It's essentially, it's law students, yeah. and lawyers, and, and foundation money to create an entirely separate world to check, to check for, for um, wrongful conviction. And just notice that's kind of an admission that the criminal system itself has failed in yeah. checking me mechanism, the fact that we need this essentially entirely into it's like journalism yeah which by the way is intimately related to our ability to even know when wrongful convictions happen but so you asked me what i thought about the innocence um projects and i just you know because we have a a, a, a vulnerable audience here i just want to put a couple of things out there because i think that the next generation of innocence work yeah. is going to take on these issues one's going to take on the guilty plea because there's no way to really encompass that the, the moral wrong of innocent people being convicted and punished without recognizing that actually the vast bulk of them are gonna take place to the guilty plea. And then the second, of course, because I have to say it is misdemeanor. Yeah. Um, and so as you pointed out, that the mechanisms of innocence work take so long, actually the misdemeanor, if the misdemeanor even got a sentence of incarceration. It's going to be over. They've gone on, but they're right. Like, so it's an enormous crack through which misdemeanor cases fall. But we know we have, you know, we we know that people plead guilty to misdemeanors of which they're innocent yeah. all the time. All the time. Often because they can't make bail, so they plead guilty and take time served to get out. And so I think that if anybody here is looking for their next commitment, um. <laughs> Uh, guilty pleas I've, and misdemeanors, I think, are that, that the innocence movement has made such a difference in our criminal system. That's the next couple chapters, I think. And this is what, one of the reasons, among many, why your book has earned so many accolades and won so many prizes, because what you have done in Punishment Without Crime is you've exposed how corrupt our misdemeanor system is. How, I mean, if you are detained prior to trial in a misdemeanor, it would be foolish not to accept a deal almost. Right? Why run the risk of being convicted and getting extra time in jail? And so you have people who are pleading out to things they may or may not have done. They have a crime on their rap sheet 
as you talk about in your book, the collateral consequences that flow from having a criminal record, even a misdemeanor, are so sizable and so hard to calculate. The question is, and I'll throw it back to you because I'm really curious about this, how could we structure a misdemeanor innocence clinic or a guilty plea innocence clinic? Uh, so I've had preliminary conversations with folks in the yeah. innocence world about this as plea bargaining and misdemeanors um, sort of make their way into this conversation. It turns out, so, so part of this depends on the defense bar yeah. and in particular public defender offices. Uh, so when I was working on the book, I reached out and interviewed lots of public defenders. And I said, do you, wh what do you think about this phenomenon yeah. of the innocent pleading guilty? And they say it happens all the time. All the time. We're not, yeah. we don't want it to happen, but it's our client's decision. If they want to get out and can't make bail, we can't say this is a miscarriage of justice, stay in jail. Yeah. So they, so actually there's a professional community that knows when it happens. And I, and I feel like a conversation between um, the defense bar, the public defender community and the innocence, uh, the innocence network on this question, it would take an innovation, right? Yes. It wouldn't be the usual, okay, we get 500 pages of record and go over yeah. the record of the trial that happened five years ago. It would be different, but we have a room full of creative people. Yes, here. give us some and ideas. They will think of something. Well, and this reminds me, I, I know this is something you've thought about. Uh, Michelle Alexander, who wrote the great book, The New Jim Crow, maybe 2010, I can't remember exactly when it came out, maybe 10 years ago, wrote a really cool op-ed a few years ago called Crash the System. Do you remember this one? Where she basically said, the whole problem is public defenders, of course, have an individual obligation to their clients. So in that unitary one-on-one -on -one situation, you have an obligation to not dissuade your client from taking that good deal. You know, you're facing 25 take the deal for eight, or it's the client's decision, but you wouldn't sort of push the client one way or the other. But if everyone, all public defenders were united, it's classic collective action problem, were united to say, we're not taking deals. Every case goes to trial. The system would crash. That was her argument. And no one, no innocent or guilty wouldn't take deals. Who would get, the prosecution would have to decide which cases to try. It would probably be either the strongest cases, the ones that they thought could lead to a conviction and or the ideally the crimes that had the most consequence to victims and survivors of violence. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, there's a, I mean, how do we reconcile? Yeah. Oh yeah, we're not, yeah. This is more interesting. <laughs> this is our next project. This is when we go out for frozen yogurt. Yes. Um, but, but speaking of public defense, yeah. so it is one of the um, great, repositories of, can I say secret knowledge? It's knowledge, it's an incredibly knowledgeable space, but it's sworn to secrecy. Yeah. And so yes. it's, sometimes it's hard to mine mm -hmm. the insights, but, but those of us who are fortunate to have had that experience in work and then to be able to come and be, uh, do, do scholarship and, and, and conversations and work and teaching about it, we get to bridge that gap. Right. Is there a, is there a story or a case that, Kind of encapsulate that insight that that you're now yeah. allowed to share with us. Yeah. So I mean, there are a bunch a bunch of war stories that I tell. I just want to make sure I have enough time for this. Um, there are a lot of war stories that I share in the book, and probably the one that relates to the plea process and relates to all these issues is actually one that I did share with my students the other day. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the short version. Um, there was a robbery in Long Island in 1999, and a large white man went into a restaurant. It wasn't a popular restaurant. There was just a cook and a waitress. The man uh, robbed the waitress while the cook was preparing the meal. She gave him money from the cash register, and he fled. He was identified by both of them as a tall, heavy set white man in his mid thirties. And he was um, seen fleeing in a late model white car, New York plates with a T and a one in the license plate. Both of the, both the waitress and the cook identified the same guy, Stephen Schultz as the perpetrator. Um, he fit the bill, he was six foot two, 250 pounds, 35 years old, but nothing in his record showed that he was a violent person. And he also had an alibi. He was home watching TV with his roommate not a great alibi, though most of our alibis stink. We're with loved ones or we're alone, right? Seldom are we like caught on camera walking by CCTV. It's not London after all, right? Like, like it, just, it just doesn't work like that. And he was watching, I made this joke in class, he was watching Dharma and Greg. Do you remember Dharma and Greg? You're too young. 
Did you, did you have, okay. So it was a really, it was, yeah. <laughs> You don't want me to talk about your age? Come on. Okay, Dumb and Greg, bad, bad show. So you don't lie about it. It's your alibi, right? It's like a Real Housewives of Bel Air or something like of Summer. I don't know. It's bad, okay? So, but he had no money for a lawyer. He got a really bad public defender. And while he couldn't get bail, he didn't have enough money. And his lawyer doesn't do anything. He's in detention, waiting for trial. He's offered a three-year deal. He says, no, I'm innocent. I would never use a knife. I would never threaten a woman. It was a little misogynistic, but like it was against his code. I, I, I just wouldn't be violent toward a woman. He did all these other things, but like that was something he wasn't going to plead guilty to. He's offered three years, though he's facing upwards of 10. And he says, no, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to try. And while he's in prison, he reads the local newspaper, and there's an article about another guy who looks just like him, who had pled guilty to six analogous robberies in the area. His picture's there, and it happened around the same time, bookending this one. He tries to call his lawyer, who doesn't pick up because it's a collect call. <laughs> so he gets his sister to call his lawyer, and the sister's like, dude, Barry, that's his name. Oh, I won't say his last name, should I? No. She's my counsel. Barry, investigate this. Read the paper, investigate it. It's like, I'm too busy. Let's see what happens at trial. Case goes to trial. The cook identifies Stephen as the perpetrator, the man he saw in the restaurant, the man he saw fleeing in the car. Then the waitress gets up there and doesn't identify him. She's like, now that I see him in the flesh, I realize that's not the guy. The guy who did it was taller and heavier. Well, guess what? The man from the newspaper two inches taller, 100 pounds heavier. But the lawyer had not asked the waitress, had not done any legwork with the pretrial investigation. So you don't want to show a picture cold to a witness like that, because what if she says, no, that's not the guy either. There, just mu there must be some a third heavy set schmuck running around Brentwood, New York, committing this type of crime. So he tries to get the photo into evidence to just give the jury a sense that there's a third party suspect and that Stephen Schultz, this guy, might have been mistaken for the third party suspect. The judge turns it down. The judge exercises his discretion and says, there's not enough of a link between this photo and this crime. Stephen's convicted, he's sentenced to 11 years in prison. He writes me, I'm doing this innocence project at Brooklyn Law School, my students and I start investigating it. We lose the direct appeal, the vertical remedy, because the only issue we could raise was the admissibility of that photograph. And the judge, John Copertino was his name, hadn't abused his discretion because the case law basically gave a ju the judge a lot of leeway in introducing evidence of what's called third party uh, culpability. So we lost, lost the direct appeal, but we investigated all this stuff. And guess what we found? Dharma and Greg was showing. This was like pre-streaming too. So if it was in TV Guide, it was, it was really, it happened, right? It was showing at that time and that was the episode that Stephen had claimed. We interviewed his roommate who said, who was very credible. He didn't have a criminal record. And he's like, Dan, I went to the courthouse that day. I was gonna testify for Stephen, but that lawyer Barry wouldn't let me do it. The lawyer said no one would believe me. We got him to sign an affidavit saying he was home watching Dharma and Greg on the night in question. We then investigated the cook and we found out that the cook, the only person who had identified Stephen Schultz at trial, had his own pending gun charge that disappeared weeks after his testimony against Stephen Schultz. No deal, no nod and a wink. Sasha's first book was called Snitching about informants and the deals that are made on the slide. It made me think of snitching this whole scenario. And then we found the waitress who was really hard to find. And I showed her a picture of Stephen Schultz and this other guy, Anthony Guilfoyle. And she identified this other guy, Anthony Guilfoyle as the perpetrator and we got an affidavit. So I got all this new evidence, we assembled it, and we filed this quorum nobis petition in New York, newly discovered evidence that would have made a difference had it been presented at trial. And we drove to Riverhead, New York, the county seat for Suffolk County, New York, and we tried to convince this judge, John Copertino, not to give us a new trial, but just to give us a hearing on this evidence. And I really just wanted to impress my students at this point. Right? Because as a teacher, you want them to think you know what you're doing. So I'm like, all right, guys, we're going to go. Come with me. We just, we're going to win this. 
always manage expectations. That was so such a rookie mistake. Yeah. Never. Right. I know I was young. I didn't have gray hair. So the judge said no, no evidentiary hearing. He said he remembered the case and the waitress was scared. I remember her. She was scared, Medwed. She didn't identify your guy because she thought he was going to come back with a knife. I'm like, no, this other guy did it. I just talked to her. You never. We bailed on the case. I headed for the hills. Literally, I moved to the University of Utah. Like, I was done. And Stephen called me up like a year later. And he said, you know, Dan, you know, remember how in all of those filings you did, you used ineffective assistance of counsel as an alternative argument? Like, you said I was innocent. And I love that you did that. But, like, you went down in flames on that one. But, but you also said that Barry was ineffective for not investigating the case um, and not putting my roommate on the stand as an alibi witness. Well, you know, I filed a, a federal habeas corpus petition because that's a constitutional issue. I did it on my own um, and the judges granted me a hearing. Um, what would you like to, to handle it? <laughs> that part's not in the book, the pro se part of it. Uh, I sort of screwed, but it's true. I mean, we, we botched it, like we didn't think we could do anything. So I said, yeah, we'll take it, of course. Like, and I got some lawyers in New York, my old colleagues to do it. And he won on the grounds of ineffective assistance of counsel. He was freed on a constitutional violation, but he was never declared innocent. So he got out eight years after he was first detained, just a few months before he would have re been released anyway on good time served, never declared innocent, never received any compensation. Lives in New Jersey with his longtime partner, Lisa, and their dog, Christmas, a stray that they found Guess what day they found the stray? Valentine's. Valentine's. That would be so. That would be so. That would be great. On the twenty fifth of December, a few years ago, we have a picture, right, Deborah, of Stephen and his dog. So he is free. Because I thought maybe I talked about this. So you gave me the opening. Um, but you know, he's been traumatized, right? He's never been declared innocent. He carries this decision with him at all times. I love to tell this story. I told my students about this when I asked him what the, his favorite part of his freedom is. It wasn't like walking in New Jersey, because like, of course, walking in New Jersey is no one's favorite part of anything. But it wasn't walking on the beach with Lisa or playing fetch with Christmas. He said it was his debit card because he used his debit card all the time to provide an alibi. Like every you know hour or so, he would buy a pack of cigarettes or a six pack of beer um, to provide an alibi. Yeah. So like this case, right? So you think about it, white, guy with a savvy sister who had the wherewithal to get the pro bono services of two law professors and ultimately six students. He couldn't prove his innocence and it took eight years and then he only got out based on ineffective assistance of counsel. No consequences for Barry. Isn't Christmas cute? Oh, so, I mean, he was cute or she was cute. Do we have time to talk a little more? I, I want to make sure we have oh, time I don't know. for Q&A. Oh, five minutes. We'll talk some more. Oh, good. The benefit of talking quickly. So, so we just have a few more minutes. Can we skip skip to the end? Yeah. So, so of what does it mean that, that the end of our system is so um, narrow and cramped and inhospitable and mm -hmm. how... You've been doing this a long time, and this is not the only right. part of the criminal system that you've studied and written yeah. about it. But the the idea that the end that we're just not going to look, yeah, right, we're gonna we're gonna wager it all on the values of finality, yeah. and we're not going to recognize yeah. innocence. Do you, can you just share a little bit how you think that has distorted and deformed other aspects of our criminal system, or maybe? How we think about it as attorneys? What what in what shadow is that cast? I mean, the shadow is pervasive, and I think the takeaway, and I'm curious what you think, Sasha, about this, is what we've learned about the back end tragedy should inform our front end solutions. And what folks who are involved in this work, yes, you know, I write about and litigate and and do reform work in the area of post conviction remedies and appellate procedure because that's what I know and that's what I care about. But the sort of public takeaway is we just have to get it right the first time. 
we have to get it right at the front end. So folks who do this work, right, who do innocence work, people like Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld and various people across the country, Valena Beatty, tons of people, what we often do with the data sets and these stories is we say, what can we do to make the system more accurate on the front end? So we would never have heard of this case. I wouldn't know about Christmas. We wouldn't know about this injustice if Stephen had been a little more risk averse and taken that three year plea, right? So how do we change plea bargaining? It goes to your point. One thing I thought about a lot, Italy does this. I'm curious what you think about this. Is there really is no gap on the difference between your plea offer and your trial exposure? If you're facing 25 years to life, you could be offered a one year deal. And you might take that deal just if you're risk averse. Even if you think it's just a 10% chance that you're gonna get convicted, you might take a one year deal because you don't wanna run the 10% risk of spending the rest of your life in prison. What Italy says, they cap the discount or the tax at, you can only offer two thirds of the trial exposure. So if you're facing six years at trial, the plea deal is four, max. I mean, it's minimum, like it can't be less than four. And so it's interesting when I talk about this and I'm curious what some of you think. From my perspective, I like this because it doesn't induce the innocent who are really risk averse to take the deal. Because if you're innocent, you might think the difference between four and six is important, but I'm gonna try to vindicate my innocence and take that risk. The difference between one and six is big enough that I might just take the one. But a lot of defense lawyers don't like this for the obvious reason. And this goes to your point culturally. For a defense lawyer, what's a win? A defense lawyer's win is getting a plea deal of one when you're facing six. So if you talk to a lot of public defenders about this idea, when I talk to some of my pals from legal aid, they're like, don't suggest this. It'll make my job so much worse because my clients are gonna still take the deal, but they're just gonna get a worse deal. So I don't know, like, so some of these front end reforms, another one is, videotaping interrogations so you can protect against false confessions. You can make sure and better monitor whether someone is falsely confessing. But as a defense lawyer, do you want a video record of your client's interrogation? You're a PD in Baltimore. You do not want that. But it would, so to what extent is there a balance between fairness and accuracy? Can we reform the system to make it more accurate, but also, but without sacrificing fairness? Or is it always zero sum? I don't know, do you have any thoughts on that? So I'm teaching criminal procedure this semester and we're just, we just did Strickland. Ooh, and ineffective so Strickland assistance. Is a case that, um, that tells us how to evaluate ineffective assistance of counsel. And that's exactly the tension yes. between what's a just outcome, a fair outcome, and what's an accurate outcome. And as uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall yeah. presented in that case, yes. and he said, that shouldn't be the trade-off. If we're looking for accuracy, what you're saying is that people who might be guilty are less entitled to procedure. So it's a real tension yeah. between so many people get swept up in our criminal system through over-criminalization. So we have an infinite supply. They're guilty. Why? Because the code makes them guilty. Exactly. They're not innocent. They still deserve a just process. So I think that's yeah. that's really right on the nose. Yeah. Um, Maya is telling us that we don't, don't have a, a million years left. So I, uh, can we take some? Yeah, yeah. please. Any so questions? if we could give a uh, one more hand to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are going to move to Q and A. So uh, we have a couple of my colleagues coming around with microphones. If you have a question for our speakers, please raise your hand. Uh, Professor Natapov will call on you and then you can uh, say your question. We do have some folks joining us on Zoom as well. So please uh, uh, be mindful and speak into the mic so that everyone, including our online participants can hear you. Uh, if you're joining through Zoom, please use the, the Q&A function uh, to share your question. Uh, and our Zoom moderator, Debbie, will be reading that out loud on your behalf. Uh, so let's get started. Um, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess I had a question about resource allocation, right? Um, I think Innocence Project is something that is like more attractive to fund um, by a lot of ideologies, right? 
Um, and, you know, I think a common argument in the PD space is that this is taking resources away from the front end, right? Um, and on a more theoretical le level, right, saying that innocent people should be our priority right. also is like a theoretical framework that maybe necessarily implies that other people should be in jail, right? Um, so on both like a theoretical way and in a pra pragmatic re resource allocation way, I'm curious if you could talk about um, yeah, why you think Innocence Project in particular is a viable yeah. approach? That's a great question. So let, uh, let me talk about the pragmatic uh, issue first. I think there are different funding streams, right? So if public defenders are funded principally by counties, and one thing that's really perverse about our system, especially for prosecutors, is the split funding of our criminal legal system. So prosecutors are funded by counties, but prisons are funded by the state. So prosecutors don't take a hit for mass incarceration. Like they have no financial damage for saying like, you know, let's just recommend a life sentence to this person because it's not coming out of their budget, not even indirectly, right? So the public defender funding stream really is coming from the, from the county for the most part. With some places where there's state funding, innocence projects seldom if ever are founded by the government. There are a few places where there is a PD office that might get funding for a small innocence unit, but for the most part, and Sasha alluded to this, innocence projects are the, the creature of like white liberal guilt. You know, you, you get foundations, you get deans, you get you know, big, big law lawyers who have regrets um, that will fund innocence projects so that law professors and students can do this work. And this is money that wouldn't otherwise go to the public defense community. Now, it would maybe go to some other progressive cause, but I don't think it would go to public defense. So I think it's a different bucket of resources. At least that's sort of how I justify it. The theoretical question, Louisa, is a great one which is if you are focused on the actually innocent, are you sending a, a, a message that some criminal defendants are more valuable, valuable, more worthy of extra resources, extra attention than others? Are you saying that the conviction of a factually innocent person is a greater harm to society than racial bias, um, systematic uh, Brady violations, failure to disclose exculpatory evidence of other uh, Fifth Amendment Miranda violations. And I wrote an article about this called Innocentrism, which is innocentric advocacy, I think, is, is a complement. It's not a, it, it, it doesn't replace um, rights-based advocacy and that we can work sort of harmoniously to it. Like, just because I'm working in this space doesn't mean I'm taking away from other people working in other spaces. We can still join together and work on things that are uh, mutually beneficial. So for instance, one reform that folks involved with innocence work often suggest is changing eyewitness identification procedures to make them slightly more accurate. So the way innocent um, identification identification procedures often work, like in the Stephen Schultz case that I described, is you're given six photos or six people who all loosely resemble the initial description of the perpetrator. And when you're given six options like that, what do you do? You go into a restaurant with six um, menu options. You pick the one that, that seems best. You engage in a comparative or relative judgment option. You don't, uh, judgment. You don't make an absolute judgment, right? I want the pad thai. You just pick the best thing of the six and you're gonna pick something because you're in a restaurant. And this could lead to mistakes because you pick the person who most closely resembles the perpetrator. I think that's what happened to Stephen Schultz. He looked a lot like this guy, Anthony Guilfoyle. It wasn't bad faith on the part of the waitress and um, the cook. They're just like, here's a guy who looked like him. But if they had been shown what's, that's called a simultaneous lineup. Some of us think you should do what's called a sequential lineup one photo at a time, one person at a time, so you make an absolute judgment. Do I want the pizza? No. Do I want the pad thai? Yes. Now, the problem with this, from the defense perspective, there's a sense that it could be good because sometimes people will not identify anyone. They'll keep waiting for the right person and they'll miss on the actual suspect, right? So this is kind of a win-win both for public defenders and the defense community rights folks and for folks who are concerned with innocence. So are there places I think where, where it's synergistic? I don't know, do you have anything to add on this? I know because I, the theoretical question yeah. is that tension between yeah. innocentrism, which is a great article by the way, um, for those of you who are interested in these questions and uh, 
and as a former public defender yeah. myself, I've grappled with these questions as I have done work with innocence projects and on innocence cases. And I'll give you an example of where I think, another example yeah. of where I think the issues converge. So uh, in, so as a public defender in Baltimore and in Baltimore, as in New York and many cities, every Friday night, police would go out and they would round up a lot of young men of color and arrest them for loitering. Loitering was the sort of social control um, uh, offense of choice in Baltimore, in New York, it's trespassing. Other yeah. places, sometimes it's disorderly conduct. They sort of pick one. Uh, no one's actually loitering. The definition of loitering in Baltimore is impeding the free flow of vehicular or pedestrian traffic after having been warned to desist and failing to desist. That's impressive. It's hard to loiter. Like, you got yeah. to work at that. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not loitering. They go to BCD, Baltimore City Detention Center, which is a dangerous, unsanitary pit. They can't make bail. They plead guilty. Those are wrongful convictions, yep. right? They're not guilty of the thing for which they now have a criminal conviction. And notice that, that understanding that as wrongful conviction also dovetails with other things we know about the criminal system. So it's racially disproportionate. It's the, so those order maintenance type offenses are disproportionately enforced against black men. Um, it's a kind of criminalization of poverty because the pressure to plead is also you know, related to the inability to make bail and also living in a neighborhood in which that kind of policing takes place. So I thought long and hard. So there's a chapter in my misdemeanor book about this phenomenon. Yes. And I thought long and hard about the tension yeah. because there, there was something in me that said, am I going to lift up innocence when my concern is the integrity of and the, and the um, unfairnesses of the criminal system visited against everyone not just the innocent am i giving yeah. something up and it was because this example to me captures just why innocence the, the reason that we convict so many innocent people innocent people is because we don't care about them mm -hmm. and that's true for innocent and guilty alike it's the dehumanization i think and that and the disrespect for those individuals and those lives that permits yeah wrongful conviction, but also permits racially disparate policing and conviction and, and harsh sentences and bail that no one can pay. And, and so I actually think the root cause the de yeah. of dehumanization and disrespect lies at the root of all these dysfunctions. And like Daniel said, it's different ways. He's a gastroenterologist. I'm an optometrist. You're a brain surgeon. Ophthalmologist. Ophthalmologist. Hmm? Ornithologist. I'm, a, I'm one of the, those a different, you know, the, the corpus. Neurologist. The corpus is the same, yeah. but to come, so I wouldn't, that's how I have, it, why I feel like it's important yeah. not to give up on the innocence principle, even though you're absolutely right, it's intention with some other principles that we hold here. And, and this, I have an entry point. Oh, please. At least it's a point. As a former pop, as a former public defender, do you ever see a situation where you are constrained with financial support to carry out effective investigation as compared to the prosecution team, which have it all? Inequities of financial strength between prosecution and defense, which may affect the defense team. All the time, right? When I was at Legal Aid at the Appellate Bureau, we had at one halftime investigator, Joe, who didn't drive. He didn't know how to drive because all we could afford now, we know New York City, right? New York City, the myth is you can get everywhere by mass transit. Is this true? Where can you not get by mass transit in New York City? Places in Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, places coincidentally, majority minority neighborhoods that are over-policed and result in a lot of miscarriages of justice. So what Joe would do is he would take taxis to these places and then bill us for the taxis. So basically, we, you know, he'd get time and I mean, it was nuts. So the prosecutor has its own investigators and they have this thing called like the NYPD, just call up the biggest law enforcement agency in essentially the world and get free pro bono assistance. So the answer is yes, <laughs> right? Same thing in Baltimore, I'm sure. Though at the trial level, you have more investigators, right? You probably had a bunch. So 
I practice in the federal public defender's office. That's right. So you did. had more resources. Yeah. He famously has more resources. He did have investigators um, and more resources and more time uh, for each case. Yeah. And okay. fancier courtrooms. Slightly fancier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I want to tell you, Daniel and uh, Alexandra, thank you for thank making you. me relive my prosecutor days. Uh -oh. Even though it was 100 <laughs> years ago. Thank you for making me relive it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. Let's give our guests a round of applause. Thank you.